This passage that we just heard from the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, maybe better known, better titled the Acts of the Holy Spirit, um, is it's a fascinating uh, passage to me. Um, and it begins with that question that the authorities in Jerusalem ask of Peter. They had heard that he had shared the good news with Gentiles, with non-Jews. And they, they, I'm not sure if that's what they were most upset about because what they accuse him of is eating with those uncircumcised people. And this is very significant. Who we break bread with, who we share fellowship with, says a lot about who we trust and respect and, and welcome, right? If you're not willing to sit down at table with someone, um, can you ever truly love them? Uh, or can you ever truly love someone who you would not be willing to share your food with? Um, I think that's an important question. And it's a question that they put to Peter. Why did you eat with those uncircumcised people? And this is, this is an important story, and, and I, I, it must be important because we hear it at least twice in, in the book of Acts. In chapter 10, 10 of the book of Acts, it begins with um, uh, a, a centurion, okay? Cornelius was his name. This is the part where you have to take my word for it, okay? It's right there in the first verse of chapter 10. Cornelius was a centurion, um, and he was a, a, one of the Italian cohort, it says. Meaning, he's, he's not just a, a, a Roman soldier who was hired there locally. He's a Roman soldier who came in from Rome. He's one of the Italians, and he is... Um, but it goes on to say he was a God-fearing man, he and his whole family, and they supported and, made, and donated to the local synagogue. So they, they gave alms to the people, it says. Well, the people, in this context, are the Jews. And so Cornelius was one of those large numbers of people that we've heard about before that were called God-fearers. They were Gentiles who worshipped God, who worshipped God, and many of them would keep the, the, um, the rules or the laws, try to obey, to, to obey the, the laws of Moses. But they were not included in, they weren't welcomed in or even invited to become Jews themselves. Okay? And so that's who, that, that's who Cornelius was, and it was a problem for the, the Jewish leaders of the Christian movement, this, of this way in Jerusalem, when they hear about Peter breaking bread with these people. And so Peter shares that amazing story that we heard in chapter 10 in full detail, and then we hear it again today in chapter 11 about the, the sheet that came down from heaven full of unclean beasts, beasts that no observant Jew would ever kill and eat. And we hear the whole story that God says, what I have said made holy, you shall not call unholy. And the thing that's, one of the things that's really cool about this is, is that Peter shares his story with them. He shares the story of what happened when he had this vision Right? And at the end of this vision, these men appeared, showed up, inviting him to come at, uh, at, to, to, to the centurion's house. And he went with six of his fellow uh, apostles, I guess, or brothers, they, they call them. Six of them go with these men that came, and they, and they break bread with, and with Cornelius and his family, and Cornelius and his family receive the Holy Spirit. When they hear Peter teaching about Jesus and how Jesus reveals God, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. In the same way that the, the first Jewish Christians were. And, and that probably means that they were speaking in tongues and they were uh, understanding one another. And, and you know all of those things that, that we hear about in the, um, the second chapter of Acts, so, or the fourth chapter of Acts. So, 
Peter shares his story with the people in Jerusalem, and they get it. His story is compelling. Who are we to say no if God has said yes to them? Okay. And, and th that's the detail of this that I really want to zero in on, that Peter shared his story. Because the stories that we share help us build the relationships that, that, that weave us together as the body of Christ. It, these are the stories that we share with one another. When we share our own story, we are helping others to see us as brothers and sisters, as siblings in the body of Christ, in the family of Christ. And when we hear someone else's story and we begin to see their humanity, the, that they are also potentially someone that God might love, Right? When we hear their story and we can see their humanity, see the, what's lovable about them, it builds that web of relationship that makes us the body of Christ. Last week we had a gift um, when Deacon Allen gave his sermon just a few weeks after the death of his wife and, and he shared the story. He titled that sermon, uh, My Sheep hear my voice. They know my voice, right? And it was a series of stories of Alan hearing God's voice, mostly in his relationship with Janet. It was mostly about hearing God speak to him through that love, right? And he shared that with us, and we were able to see into that loving relationship a little bit and be wound together, woven together with Alan and Janet and their family just a little bit more. And then later, uh, last week, or I, I, I'm sorry, it was this week, we got a message that one of our own, um, Deacon Richard Buhrer, um, is going into hospice care. And he's, he's, had a, uh, he's had a long couple of years of just living in an adult family home. He's not able to do much for himself. So, you know, life's been hard for Richard already um, since he left us. And, um, and now it's gotten to the point where they're putting him into hospice care. So the end is coming. And, and when I heard this, I, I felt compelled to share a little bit of, of Richard's story, the story that he shared with us, um, that he shared with me as a priest. And, uh, and, and Richard's story is remarkable. As a young man, he was a Jesuit. He became a Jesuit and he was ordained a priest and he was educated in that wonderful Jesuit system of education. And at some point in his young adulthood, he became uncomfortable with this notion that in the church that he had given his life to, someone who was a gay man could not be accepted that a gay man could not be loved by God, and that the only way that he could be a part of this church was to lie about who he was as a human being and, and to, to hide that part of himself. He was encouraged to hide that part of himself and not express it publicly because that's not okay. All right? And he wasn't willing to do that, so he left the church. He left the Jesuit order. And he was very angry about it. You can imagine that, right? You can imagine that if you've committed yourself to something and then you realize that, that, that that commitment can't be honored and be true to yourself, that's a hard thing to do. So he left the church and he, for years, refused to even attend any worship service of any kind. And then one day, someone here in Seattle invited Richard to a wedding. And Richard, his response was, I don't go to weddings, I don't go to churches. And this, his, this friend of his says, I think you're going to want to come to this one. And so somehow this friend managed to get Richard to show up to a wedding at St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Queen Anne. And this was in the mid-90s, so this was quite a progressive thing they were doing there. It was the wedding of two men. And there they were doing a, a wedding. This was right around the time when the diocese was grappling with uh, the, the whole issue of human sexuality and the, the statement of koinonia, you may recall that, and the whole notion that everyone is beloved of God and that everyone should have the right to be married. And so he goes and there's these two men being married and it just blew his mind here. He is just angry as anything, and, and, 
and there are two men, and their, their relationship is being celebrated, and it is being held up as a holy thing. And that was the beginning of, for, for Richard of a journey back into the church. He came back into the church as an Episcopalian and, uh, and became a deacon in the church. And when I first met him, he was the head of our clergy association. He was the president of the clergy association, and I was elected to the board. And, and then he came and he served here. And I loved, he used to call me his, his, his little Protestant priest because I'm so bad at the high church stuff. I just, I just never learned it as a kid. I don't, I mean, I can be taught, I can do it, but he always had to show me anything new, right? And so he, he thought that was pretty funny. And he was a wonderful gift to this congregation. But that moment when he went into that church and suddenly realized that there was a place where he could be honored and loved, that's, that's the moment. That was his moment. That was his story that he shared with us, that he shared with clergy and with other people of uh, being called by God back into the church. And then uh, another story which I heard yesterday, um, and I have permission to share this story. This is John's story, and I'm just going to share a little part of it. Um, John was also a young uh, monastic. Uh, he was a Franciscan, and he made his life profession to the Franciscan order, and he was educated in the Franciscan education system and, and has a master's in theology and all kinds of good things. And um, he would have a PhD if, uh, if, if he had been a priest, right? Isn't it something like that, right? Anyway, there were all kinds of rules that, that he didn't love. And eventually, he really didn't love that he had to again, pretend to be a straight man in, uh, in the order in order to stay. And they told him, don't worry. Lots of people do it. It's not a problem. But he wasn't willing to do that. He wasn't willing to be in a place where who he was couldn't be honored. And so he left. And he left and was wild and crazy the way young men are wild and crazy and angry, right? The way that we get angry when, when we can't be honored in places that we want to be. And eventually, someone invited John to church, and he had a similar reaction. I don't go to church. He says, well, you might like this one. <laughs> and so they went to St. John's Episcopal Church in the Mission District, and it was full of people like John. There were people in leather. There were people who were obviously homeless. There were people who had drug problems. It was, at least, it looked like that, right? They, there were all kinds of people, and they were all welcome in this place. And John went in there, and he thought, oh my gosh, here's a place where I can be loved, where I can be included, where who I am can be honored, and that my love of God isn't dismissed as invalid because of who I am. And it's sort of the flip of what happened in, in Peter's story. They're asking Peter, how could you go to those people? How could you go to a church where they have ushers wearing leather, right? <laughs> That was a San Francisco thing, all right, where they have ushers wearing, uh, you know, leather and, and people who are obviously not, you know, of the upper class, uh, people who are obviously not one of us, who are welcome and included in that congregation, right? Peter was told, how could you eat with those Gentiles? How could you eat with those uncircumcised people is the word that they used. And Peter said, I, I had to. Because God told me, and he shared that story. And as I heard Peter's story, and as I remembered Richard's story, and, 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 and yesterday John shared his story with me, what occurred to me was that we have the opportunity as God's people to be a welcoming place where all are welcome, all are loved, all are fed, right? Well, it's, that's not the right order, but it's, yeah, it's on earth as in heaven, all are welcome, all are fed, and behind the music stand it says all are loved. Not, not a problem there, music stand people. 
And um, that, that's the opportunity that we have. We have the opportunity to be, for people, anyone who comes through those doors, to be a welcoming place and to let people know that here in this place, you are welcome. You're welcome to eat with us. We will break bread with you. We will share table fellowship with you. We want to do that. And you will be loved.